Saturday, March 15, 2014 I was talking before about the subtle art of manipulating people. Mentalism, Dan calls it. I thought he'd just got that word from the television show. You know, the one starring Simon Baker. I've never watched it. I don't bother with TV very often. But I've seen the ads from time to time. Anyway, Dan assured me it was a legitimate term. Then he said I should look up the stage performer Darren Brown, which I did, while Dan was busy finishing off the EP yesterday. I ended up spending a whole hour going from one of his videos to another. I became quite entranced. That sort of ability to manipulate people is a skill indeed, way beyond my meagre attempts at Wu Wei. But don't get the wrong idea. What Dan has in mind is scarcely in Darren Brown's league. Still, one mentalist wouldn't love to have a 3D printer slash eraser of the kind that's in the basement. That's Dan's trump card. Maybe technology can make up for the subtlety in this context. We certainly hope so. In fact, we're banking on it. The plan essentially involves a carrot and a stick. Neither would work on Ian on their own. In fact, Frank, Dan and I are all well aware that they wouldn't work even in combination. That's not the point. The point is to make Ian believe we expect them to work. This involves a bit of overkill. The overkill is what provides distraction. Then there are a number of backup strategies. Dan and I spent over an hour running through them with Frank yesterday. Principal among these was a firearm. There was a great deal of excitement over this. You know, boys and their toys. Frank said, I'm sending you some insurance, nephew. It should arrive. Just about now. I started walking over, but Frank saw me and said, Dan had better take this. I soon realized what he meant. As I opened the door, I was confronted with a handgun lying on the floor. The slide was pulled back and there was a full cartridge next to it. There was also a silencer, like the ones you see in the movies. I backed out straight away. Dan was right behind me, so he picked it all up carefully, checked the chamber for rounds, and brought it back to the screen where Frank was waiting. Geez, Frank, where did you get this? I got the gun itself from my friend. You know the one who makes the identity documents? He can get anything you want, although I only had to borrow this one. That's the thing about having the printers. You don't need to buy a particular thing if you can hold it for long enough to make a copy. You've got a suppressor, too. Yep. That's only on the off chance you'll have to shoot. The worst case scenario. Actually, I lie. The worst case scenario is where the gun gets taken off you. So for fuck's sake, Dan, if you decide to pull the gun out, make sure you're not too damn close to him. The last you want is him grabbing the barrel. But don't stand too far away either, or you'll miss. You were never very accurate with a handgun. And you were? Dan said, smiling. Anyway, as you can probably tell, it's a Glock 17. An oldie but a goodie. Nine millimeter. You'll see the threaded replacement barrel which I bought from Lone Wolf. Fairly easy to fit. The suppressor I got from Advanced Armament. For a change, it actually cuts the sound really well. Almost to what you hear in the movies. Great. Because I know that in many cases a suppressor does bugger all in terms of disguising the sound of a gunshot. Exactly. I've tested this one out and it works a treat. If you have to shoot, your neighbours will hopefully confuse the sound for something else. Or maybe they won't hear it at all. Especially if you're in the basement. The only problem is that the suppressor blocks the sight. Looks like I've got a ready-made excuse for missing. That's hardly a joking matter, nephew. Anyway, the idea is to threaten McRae in case he tries to get violent, not shoot the bastard. If you shoot him, we'll have to raise him, and we really want to avoid that. Dan was listening intently, screwing in the silencer. I have no idea what men find so fascinating about guns. They make me nervous. I didn't like the gun idea, but I suppose it seemed necessary. I certainly appreciate the extra insurance. Anyway, that was all for Sunday. We had to get there first, and that meant baiting Ian. And that was where the lunch meeting came in. I had Dan buy the iPhone so that we could be on FaceTime during the whole thing. I wasn't game to be there with Ian in person but I sure as hell wasn't going to miss out. It was about 12.55pm, and I had Dan on the phone. I could see him sitting in the alfresco area in a t-shirt, with his back to the plastic wall. He looked relaxed and quite cheerful. 
Dan had chosen Café e Cucina for a number of reasons. We didn't know of anyone from work who lived in South Sierra. It was public, it had an outdoor eating area, albeit one that was covered, and the plastic wind or rain protector was slightly mirrored, meaning that Dan couldn't be seen from the road. Ian would have to walk right in under the awning before being able to notice him. When you're trying your hand at mentalism, every bit of destabilization helps. As it happens, we were only talking for about two minutes when Dan said quite happily, Oh, Ian's here. Hi, Ian. Mate, over here. What the fuck, Djurjevic? You don't look too good, buddy. What happened to your face? You know bloody well what happened to my face. But how the fuck did you recover so quickly? Wasn't much to recover from. I thought I turned your face to pulp. You know what thought did? That if it planted a feather, a fowl would grow. Truth is, you hit like a girl, so I was fine. I have to say, I wasn't very pleased to hear Dan's bit of sexism here, but I decided to chalk it up to method acting. You little smart ass! I heard scraping noises. Dan seemed to pull back suddenly. Then he turned the phone around and said loudly, You're not threatening me with physical violence, are you, Ian? In public? Hi there, folks. My friend is just kidding. You're a real joker, mate. You know that? The patron, sitting a few tables away, glanced at Dan and Ian distastefully. From what I could gather, Ian had obviously tried to lean over the table to hit Dan, but couldn't quite reach, and Dan had carefully positioned other chairs so there was no easy alternative route. I watched as Ian fumed, lowering himself into one of the chairs opposite. By the way, say hi to Justine. She's on the phone right now. I felt obliged to wave and say, Hi, Ian, in a theatrical way. Dan's cheek can be quite infectious. I could see Ian's face close up now, and saw his muscles tensing at the jaw. The swelling on his mouth must have already subsided a bit, but he still looked a sight. His top lip was various shades of blue and yellow. Abruptly he smiled, and I saw the ugly gap of the missing tooth. Ah, so you have been hiding the whore. What pathetic losers you both are. I'm going to enjoy fucking you both over. Funny you should say, because that's exactly why I wanted to meet with you today. To talk about the fucking over you've already given us. And to propose a kind of peace treaty. Ian started laughing at this. <laughs> the fact that one side of his lip wasn't lifting at all made him look even more insincere than he normally does. Ah, yes, your proposal. I don't know what you think you can offer me, my friend. I already know what I'm going to do. Obviously, I didn't do my job right the first time on either of you. Now I'm going to have to call a replay and do it properly. He delivered this last line with a quiet venom and stared down the phone at me long enough to send shivers down my spine. I was very glad not to be there. I could hear Dan's voice continuing calmly. Maybe so. At least hear us out, and you can go about your business as you please. You've got two minutes, asshole. Start talking. No, we don't want to order, so just fuck off. Dan slipped the camera up to show a startled waiter was backing away. Sorry about my friend. He's had a bad day, Dan called out. Clock's ticking, Djurjevic. Okay, let's make it simple, shall we? It's a game I call Carrot and Stick. I'll start with a stick. I heard some rustling and Dan produced a folded piece of paper which he gave to Ian. What's this? A copy of a letter my good friend Mr. Picklejig sent to your firm. You know when you said I'd change the locks? It wasn't me. It was Picklejig. Basically, your threats about break-and-enter charges and notices of eviction have always been empty. You didn't know it, but I did. Ian read the letter and snorted and said, Ah, so what? So right now I've got good grounds for suing you for wrongful dismissal, wouldn't you say? Is that all you have? What a loser. There's more. Even though you hit like a girl, I'd probably want to sue you for the assault. Mr. Picklejig is also happy to sue you for the damage to his property. You remember how you smashed me into those paintings? Valdemar Colbourg originals don't come cheap. And then there's the hallway mirror and the vases. Just pocket money. Get real. Couple of grand. I'm still going to kick your ass out of town. Well, it doesn't stop there now, does it? Because Justine told me a very interesting story about a certain sexual assault, one which you perpetrated. We still have the clothing with the blood 
and your DNA. We have pictures of the injuries and the crime scene. We have a neighbor, Mrs. Lazarov, who saw you arriving and leaving at around the time of the assault. I don't believe most of that. And in the absence of real evidence, who's going to believe the word of a whore against mine? He turned to face me in the phone, saying, Try it, honey. I'll bury you so deep in your own shit you'll never dig yourself out. Well, you could do that, Dan continued. But we both know your career would also be over. Yeah, yeah, ho-hum. Ian looked down into the camera and hissed at me again. You'd have reported me already if you were going to, sweetheart, eh? We both know it'll never happen. Ian then turned back to Dan. Just like you, pathetic coward. I know you're hiding from something. You'd also have reported me too if you'd really wanted to. I've had enough. I'm leaving. With that, Ian started to get up and I saw Dan's hand reaching out. Not quite so fast. You're right that we don't want to report you. We really don't. There are good reasons for both of us to stay silent. But that doesn't necessarily mean we will stay silent. I could see Ian slowly resuming his seat. I've had enough of the games. Just get to the point. If you keep on trying to make our lives a misery, you know as well as we do that the case for reporting you will get stronger. In fact, we're basically there already, taking into account your latest threats. Justine is recording all this, by the way. You didn't think she was just here for the chat, did you? At that point, I could see the first real hint of fear ever in Ian's face. We were starting to pull him in. Dan didn't pause, though. He continued calmly. But we would still rather not make our affairs public. We'll do it if we have to. But we'd rather reach a negotiated settlement, which is where the carrot comes in. What fucking carrot? What could you possibly offer me? Money. Ian laughed so hard he almost fell over backwards in his chair when he heard this. <laughs> but I have to say the laughter sounded hollow. In fact, Dan panned the camera around and captured the faces of some of the patrons, sitting two or three tables away, and they didn't look impressed. Now, I already knew that Dan had booked and paid for a set menu luncheon, it was for his table as well as the three surrounding ones for customers who would never arrive. We needed the privacy for the next step. <laughs> OK, then, Ian said, settling down from his fake laughter. <laughs> what exactly are we talking about? $300,000 cash. And you leave us alone from now on. No contact, no abuse, no nothing. Dan was keeping the camera fixed on Ian the whole time. And I watched him sneer, both at Dan and then at me. Where would you get that sort of money? That's not your concern. You're really sad, you know that? I earn more than three times that in a year from the firm alone. Why would I be interested in such a pathetic offer? Because it's nothing to sniff at. Because it's the best we can offer to get rid of you. And because either you take it or we go the other route, the stick route. Why the fuck should I believe you? You're probably making it all up anyway. Think about it, Ian. Why would I bother doing something so pointless? Anyway, you can believe it because I can show it to you. The camera became partly obscured as Dan pulled a briefcase out from beside him. He put it on the table and pushed it forward towards Ian. That's for you as a starter. $25,000. Think of it as a sign of our sincerity. I saw Ian open the briefcase gingerly. I knew for a fact that the bundle of money inside didn't look like much. It's not the same as a briefcase brimming with cash, like you see in the movies. The other $275,000 will be yours as well, if you agree to our terms. You don't expect me to believe this crap, do you? Oh, but I do. Show him, Justine. Take a good look at what else we have to offer. I was in the main studio. I had the other briefcase with the $250,000 on the ground, open. The remaining $25,000 from the first briefcase was in a bundle next to it. I crouched down and let the iPhone camera focus closely on the notes as I flicked through each bundle of hundreds, carefully so as to show the detail. I really don't know what kind of stunt you morons are pulling. It's not a stunt. The money is yours. But only if you agree to leave us alone. That's our proposal. 
If you don't like the terms, then we'll go to Plan B, the stick. After that, we'll use our money to go somewhere else and start a new life. Some life you'll have with that paltry sum. Maybe, but Justine can sell her house too. Besides, you won't leave us any choice. Whichever way it goes, I can assure you, we'll take you down with us, McRae. Ian just sat there in what seemed to be a stare down. Dan obviously didn't waver. Eventually, Ian just jerked his head back and sniffed, or rather hawked, as if he were going to spit. At this point, Dan said, Of course, none of that has to happen. It can still be a win-win. What do you say? Ian leaned in. Let's say, for argument's sake, that I'm willing to play your game. How will it work? Easy. You'll come around to Picklejig's house tomorrow at 5 p.m., not a minute later, not a minute earlier. You drive around the back so no one sees you. You pull into the garage. We take you to where we store the money. You count it. You take it. You leave. End of story. And what's to stop me from coming back for more? Your word is a gentleman. And that stick we were talking about previously. We'll have nothing to lose then. And we'll both be madder than cut snakes. Ian rocked back on the rear legs of his chair, his fingers interlinked behind his head, and took a deep breath. You're one mad motherfucker, you know that? You're both mad. OK, I'll be there. Then he smiled, the crooked smile of someone who still has half his mouth swollen and stood up. Before he left, he said, I still love to know how you cleaned up your face so quickly. Then he picked up the briefcase containing the $25,000 and walked away. We had him.